one of the key functions of an audio professional is to quantify sound as data. This is done with an acoustic measurement microphone, and Mini DSP has recently introduced version 2 of the incredibly popular UMIC. Here's mine, so let's make some noise and get to quantifying. I've actually been using this thing for some time, but I did record the unboxing, so that's what you're seeing here. And as was the case with the original mic, this one comes nestled in a small pen box. The inventory is only 5 items long, and it includes a mini tripod, a swivel mount, a USB cable, a foam windscreen, and of course, the microphone itself. So, let's talk about what sets it apart from any of the other popular measurement solutions, including the original Yumic. For starters, the microphone capsule has been upgraded to a larger 1 half inch diameter pre-polarized condenser which translates to lower self noise and less distortion. The real party piece, however, is around the back. Namely, the USB audio interface boasting 32 bits of dynamic range and a 192 kHz sampling rate. This positions the Nyquist frequency at 96 kHz, well within the ultrasonic spectrum which is a tad overkill. Come to think of it, so is the bit depth but there is more of a practical reason for it. Right away, just to put things into perspective, here is the largest and the smallest value that we can represent using 32-bit notation. And this is floating as opposed to fixed-point arithmetic. So if we express these values logarithmically, we are looking at a dynamic span of 1528 decibels. Many orders of magnitude beyond even the most powerful shockwave sustainable in the Earth's atmosphere. Which effectively means that it doesn't very well matter where you set your gains. Your weak link will invariably be the dynamic range of the physical condenser element, not the computer's ability to store a large enough value. Digital clipping is more or less a thing of the past, and 32-bit hardware is quickly displacing the 16 and even the 24-bit legacy gear. Not so much for playback, though certainly for recording. In fact, this voiceover is being captured in a 32-bit floating point format. And I'm not the least bit concerned as to where my levels are, since I can just define them in post. Think of it as the equivalent of shooting raw with, near as makes no difference, infinity stops of dynamic range. So, to get this running in Windows, and Windows only, you'll need to install a custom audio driver. With any other operating system, including Android, it's pretty much a plug-and-play affair. Once the audio driver is installed, we connect the mic, which is recognized immediately, and now we can dick around in the mini DSP control panel. If you do anything with sound in Windows, no doubt you're familiar with the generic ASIO interface, where you can manually set your sampling rate, your buffer size, and so forth. What's more, since Mini DSP works closely with the Room EQ Wizard development team, the UMIC 2 is already supported and recognized when you launch the software. Each unit comes with a set of two calibration files which you can download from the Mini DSP website. There is one for measuring on axis and one for measuring 90 degrees off axis, which comes in handy for multi source analysis. If you happen to watch the video where I compare several different types of enclosure materials, you've already seen this microphone in use, though in this video we'll focus on the frequency response of my 3D printed bass tube. By the way, that's a project video all on its own, and it should already be out by the time you're seeing this. So, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, this is the kind of stuff you're missing out on. That being said, anytime I go to test one of my builds, someone will invariably chime in to suggest that the measurements aren't valid because the response is influenced by the physical properties of the surrounding environment. Walls, corners, floors, etc. And of course, by that same logic, it could also be argued that weighing mass this close to the planet isn't valid because the measurement is influenced by gravity. I realize that this is an argument by analogy, but the point that I'm trying to make is that a measurement lacks context unless it accounts for the conditions that are present in a use case scenario. So, for instance, if a speaker is intended to sit on a shelf against a wall, you want those quarter space conditions present in the acoustic model and in the measurements validating the predicted response. Likewise, if the acoustic model is set up to account for the effects inside of a particular vehicle, it doesn't make a lot of sense to validate the predictions of that model any place else, least of all in the middle of a padded room. I made this point in one of my earlier videos, but today I'll demonstrate it using the UMIC 2. Right away, here's the predicted response of the base tube sitting in the back of my Chevy Sonic hatchback. And here it is with the vehicle altogether removed from the simulation, leaving the enclosure to radiate out into an empty space. As you can see, the anechoic response isn't very practical. Then again, it wouldn't be as it illustrates the enclosure operating in an environment much different from the one he was modeled for. 
As it happens though, I have access to a sound room so we can validate both curves. Starting with the in-car response. Here, I decided to use the Zoom UAC2 audio interface to feed a clean signal directly into the auxiliary inputs on the head unit. So, here comes the sweep. And as I've already mentioned in the base tube video, it may not be spot on, though still close enough by all reasonable accounts. Now let's move things over to the audio dynamic sound room. And while it's not perfectly anechoic, after a fashion it should be acoustically dead enough for this test. The setup is mostly the same, except now the signal is being fed into this Emotiva BPA1 amplifier. So, another moment of silence. And once again, we arrive at a reasonably close relationship between the predicted and the actual response. So, now that we have the two complete sets of frequency response graphs, hopefully it becomes apparent why measuring in an anechoic environment is valid only if that's also where we've modeled the predicted response. As a general principle, my acoustic models are set up to account for the reflections in the structure resonances native to the actual listening space, so testing them someplace devoid of those conditions will invariably result in a margin of error, though that too can be predicted by modeling the enclosure in both the test and the listening environment. That aside, the bottom line here is that the Mini DSP UMIC 2 is a worthy piece of test gear, whether you happen to be measuring in car, in room, or in some form of a reference space. Since its arrival, it has quickly become my go-to RTA microphone, and its future-proof specs make the position all the more secure. If you already have the original UMIC, or one of its equivalents, I wouldn't necessarily recommend upgrading until some must-have piece of 32-bit exclusive measurement software comes along and renders it obsolete. On the other hand, if you're just now adding an omnidirectional measurement mic to your toolkit, the UMIC 2 is your future-proof choice. So, I hope you found that useful. Don't forget to rate the video as you see fit, consider subscribing if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!